Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I would like to introduce our speakers today. In Victoria, we have Mitzi Dean, Parliamentary Secretary for Gender Equity, and from Vancouver, uh, we have Minister Mike Farnworth, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, and he is joined by Tracy Porteous, Executive Director, Ending Violence Association of BC. Go ahead, Mitzi. Tiana Skew Nasne, Mitzi Dean. My name is Mitzi Dean, and I'm very, very honoured to join you as the Parliamentary Secretary for Gender Equity. I go by she, her pronouns, and I spoke in Lekwungen language to show my appreciation and respect for the Lekwungen-speaking people, now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, whose traditional territory I am joining you from today. Today we'll be sharing news about the need to address sexual violence. I want to start by acknowledging that sexual violence takes place in British Columbia and we have many, many dedicated staff and volunteers across our province who are working and have been working for a long time to support people across the province who have been impacted by sexual violence. Having worked in the social services sector for 30 years, I know what it's like to work on the front lines. Long hours, devastating stories and at the same time, knowing that you're making a difference. Thank you. And now, more help is on its way. It is now my honour to introduce the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, Mike Farnworth. Thank you, uh, Parliamentary Secretary Dean, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, and thank you, uh, Tracy, for uh, joining me here today. And to all of those of you who couldn't physically be here, thank you for tuning in. I'm Mike Farnworth, BC's Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. And first, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. Today is an important day because today I'm pleased to announce that our government is providing $10 million to the Ending Violence Association of BC to establish a grant program for supporting the delivery of community-based emergency sexual assault response services across the province. EVA BC will undertake this work in partnership with my ministry, the Ministry of Finance's Gender Equity Office and the Minister's Advisory Council on Indigenous Women. Once established, this grant program will help organizations deliver trauma-informed and culturally appropriate responses to better meet the needs of sexual assault survivors across the province of British Columbia, including the unique needs of Indigenous survivors across BC. The grant program will benefit immediately from EVA BC's leadership. This long-standing anti-violence organization supports many community-based victim service programs throughout our province. Programs such as the Community-Based Victim Service Program, Stopping the Violence, Counseling Programs, Outreach and Multicultural Outreach Programs, amongst many other services. Survivors need swift access to compassionate and comprehensive care. And I am confident that with their expertise and passion for helping those in need, EVA BC, in partnership with this government, will create an exceptional grant program to help provide the supports and services that survivors need. Sexual assault and other violent crimes can have devastating and long-lasting effects. And the safety of women, children, and all British Columbians is a priority for myself and this government. That's why we've increased funding within the sector and are now providing over $40 million annually to support over 400 victim service and violence against women programs across the province. With the support of the Federal Department of Justice, we've also invested in a five-year project to, development, to develop and implement a cross-sector trauma-informed practice curriculum to provide training, education, and awareness for the justice, public safety, and anti-violence community sectors to better meet the needs of sexual assault survivors. In addition, We've recently announced over $3.6 million in funding from the Civil Forfeiture Crime Prevention and Remediation Grant Program for domestic violence and sexual assault focused projects throughout the province. Now I want to take a moment to acknowledge the current situation that we are facing, not only in this province, but globally. There's no question that we are in challenging times right now, and unfortunately, Gender-based violence, including sexual assault, is known to increase during these times. 
Violence is never acceptable and it has absolutely no place in our province. And we are committed to ensuring all British Columbians have timely access to the services and supports they need when they need them. While it would be nice to have had you all join us physically today, I want to thank you for tuning in remotely. And I want to thank Tracy and everyone at EVA BC, along with all our partners across this province, because protecting our communities and citizens is very important, and we cannot do it alone. The work that all of you do is critical to making British Columbians feel safe and supported, and the services you provide to sexual assault survivors is vital to supporting their healing. Thank you. And now I'd like to uh, introduce Tracy Porteous from EVA BC. Thank you, Minister Farnworth. What a profound announcement you are making today. And thank you, Parliamentary Secretary Dean. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the acknowledgement of the need to support sexual assault survivors in our province. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Tsleil-Waututh people whose land we're gathering on today. It's at just behind us out of this room. This is a historic day for British Columbia, a day where we collectively take another bold step towards breaking the silence on sexual violence. This is a day where we reintroduce and expand lifelines and emergency networks to a crime that strikes at the heart of the very dignity and humanity of too many individuals in our province. Sexual assault is considered the only violent crime in Canada that's on the increase. Statistics Canada tell us that in 2018 there were 29,000 reports of sexual assault to the police across the country. And that marked the fourth year in a row that uh, the police saw increases of sexual assault reports. Stats Canada also tells us that only 5% of sexual assaults are reported to the police. And to those without training and to those without loved ones who have been harmed by sexual violence, I think this is the invisible epidemic. In its wake, sexual violence leaves terror and humiliation and panic and nightmares and distrust and depression. These injuries caused to survivors may not always be visible to most people, but I can tell you they are all too real, and without help they can last a lifetime. Survivors across our province deserve nothing less than to be, than to be provided with trained and sophisticated networks and services designed with their needs in mind. For the anti-violence programs across the province, uh, their support for survivors have been, uh, has been unwavering and I think this announcement today is particularly meaningful because they endured devastating program cuts 18 years ago that saw the funding to all sexual assault contracts in BC ended. So this funding will restore and in fact expand emergency response services to survivors including the provision of accompaniment to hospital to report to the police for those that choose to do so, the provision of immediate emotional support, and the assistance in navigating the storm in the aftermath of sexual assault. I want to offer my profound respect and thanks to Minister Farnworth and Parliamentary Secretary Dean because this is not an easy issue to talk about. It's not easy for survivors, it's not easy for their loved ones, it's not easy for responders or policymakers or politicians. And I think it's only through facing this issue head on are we ever going to have any hope in reducing the harm that is caused by sexual violence. I can't tell you how much I look forward to working with Ms. Minister Farnworth's staff, uh, to the staff and representatives of the Ministry of Finance's Gender Equity Office and the Minister's Advisory Council on Indigenous Women. I think together in the coming months we're going to put together a suite of services and grants that will move the dial forward for respect and dignity for survivors of sexual assault in our province. Thank you so much. And I would like to welcome uh, Parliamentary Secretary Dean back to the podium for closing remarks. Thank you. Podium for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Tracy, as well. Tracy is a remarkable woman who has been advocating for improved services in the gender based violence sector for over three decades. And our province is a safer and more supportive one because of her tireless and committed and tenacious work and everybody that she works with as well. And it's partly because of the work of Tracy and her team that I'm here today. 
I was working in the community social services sector and I was so frustrated with reading reports about preventable tragedies sharing the same lessons that we already knew about gender-based violence. And I knew I wanted to do more. I wanted to change the system. And that was part of my motivation to run for office. And here we are today, improving the system. Today's announcement has been, for me, a highlight of my work in government. During my work in the social sector, I heard far too many stories firsthand about the abuses and traumas that happened to women, girls, and non-binary people and the availability of services can make all the difference. A member of my team was date raped here in Victoria a few years ago. As soon as she came into the office, I could see that something was wrong. She had been so traumatized, she had not known where to turn to. We were fortunate that the Victoria Sexual Assault Center was here to provide service. They helped her to report her story and recover from the assault. Everyone in communities across BC needs to be able to access services after abuse and assault. Ending violence against women and girls, supporting survivors, and creating safe communities are central to our work as government. The investment that we are announcing today meet, is to meet the needs of those who are the most vulnerable and targeted. And our other work underway to support survivors of gender-based violence is also long overdue. And we also need to acknowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us all to stay home and keep our distance from family and friends. For many, staying home is not safe, and now they are even more afraid of violence and abuse. But sexual abuse and violence is not a private matter to be kept behind closed doors. Sexual violence should never be tolerated, not during this pandemic, not ever. We know we have a lot of catching up to do, and I'm grateful for all our community partners like Tracy and Eva BC, and I'm grateful for the advice from BC's Advisory Council for Indigenous Women. All of us are working towards a common goal, to help people, to stop sexual violence from traumatising lives. And once we are through the other side of this crisis, we want our girls to be able to play outside without fear. We want our female colleagues and staff to be able to walk home at night without having to look over their shoulder. We want Indigenous women to no longer be targeted. We want those who are part of the LGBTQ2S plus community to know they can live freely without the fear of gendered violence. We want a province where people of all backgrounds and abilities can live in peace and safety. We aren't there yet. There is so much more to do, but we are moving in the right direction and taking steps to build a better future for the people of BC. Thank you. So we will now open it up to questions. I would like to remind everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question to start, but if time permits, we can come back around. Uh, and please also unmute your phones. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question this morning is from Richard Zussman, Global News. I'm not sure who can answer this, but I'm just wondering if there's been any sense, Minister Farnworth alluded to during pandemics like this, we see an increase uh, in sexualized violence. Uh, have we seen that in British Columbia during this pandemic in terms of people reaching up to maybe the virtual helplines, or there's still very much concerns that um, because our society has been so disrupted that the sexual violence is happening and it's just not being reported because of the pandemic? Probably best positioned uh, to uh, to speak uh, to that question. I can tell you, I have spoken with uh, a number of organizations, and they have reported uh, different experiences uh, around the province. But I think I'll let uh, Tracy speak to that to that question. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, I think it's a little early yet for us to be able to empirically measure uh, the impact of COVID-19 in all of the areas of gender-based violence. Um, I can say anecdotally, during this pandemic, every two weeks, my organization has been on conference calls with the 300 frontline programs under our umbrella as a way to reach out to them for support and ask them, are they experiencing increases and what are their needs and how can we better support them? And in the first uh, two rounds of conference calls, so for the first four weeks, they were saying it was eerily quiet and they thought that probably what was happening is that a lot of survivors were you know, behind closed doors and, and in homes perhaps where there was domestic violence going on or in homes where there's also sexual violence going on where the offender lived and couldn't call out. 
Uh, the next round of calls, uh, people were starting to say they're, st they're seeing an increase and they're starting to get more referrals from police. And that's both for sexual assault and domestic violence. So again, er it's early days in terms of measuring the empirical aspect of statistics, but uh, we're, what we're hearing in BC is that it's starting. What I can also say is the, those experts, the service providers that are on the front lines have been saying to us that what they're most worried about is a tsunami of demand for their help that will happen once the lockdown is fully lifted. So while people are still being asked to uh, shelter in place or stay home, uh, survivors aren't free to call a community-based victim assistance program or other service to reach out for help. Um, and I think our programs are, are bracing themselves for um, what, uh, what we've been hearing uh, from China is that after the lockdown uh, was lifted, there was a, an onslaught of survivors searching for help. Next, que next question is from Binder Sedgen, CTV. Hi there. Um, I'm hoping you can walk me through how this changes um, the landscape uh, in terms of providing services for women in this province or for survivors. We've heard from other people that there's a patchwork in place currently. How far does this funding go to address that patchwork system? And also, um, you talked about support, Tracy, for um, you know accompanying people to hospitals or going to police. Um, are those systems there yet in terms of accepting um, victims and survivors and listening to them or does no more work need to be done? Um, I can deal with uh, the first part of the question and then uh, I'll let Tracy deal with the, uh, the, the, the second part. Um, so in terms of, of how this is going to assist, um, what this will do is a number of things. First off, the, the, uh, the criteria for the program will be developed in, in consultation with my ministry uh, and uh, with EVA BC. Uh, it will be designed to have flexibility to meet the needs of specific uh, organizations and specific needs uh, around the province. Uh, also recognizing uh, the unique situations that many First, or uh, First Nations organizations find themselves in. So the program will have that, that, that kind of flexibility. Um, it's also a three-year program so that organizations, once they get this funding, will be able to know that they've got it for three years so they're not having to worry about having uh, putting in place additional services or additional supports and then going, okay, uh, but what about next year? So this will allow um, 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 time for uh, program evaluation and for real delivery of, of service improvements. So that's how it's going to work. It's going to have flexibility. As for further details in terms of you know, more concrete um, uh, things that can be accomplished, uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Tracy deal with that. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, I can say that I spent the first 16 years of my uh, working life in this field at the Victoria Sexual Assault Centre. And um, when the reductions of funding happened in 2002, uh, they lost over $100,000, as did many uh, sexual assault centers that were in existence at the time. And um, so that meant that they, they were having to essentially and, and literally do bake sales to be able to keep their doors open and to be able to continue to do accompaniment to hospital to, with survivors in the middle of the night. Um, and that's been the case for many other services across the province. Now, in the ensuing 18 years, the ingenuity of women and feminists and anti-violence services uh, you know, never ceased to astound me. Um, so as I said, bake sales and trying to ask access dollars from civil forfeiture, uh, from gaming, from fundraising, from doing events in their communities. Um, so people have been spending a lot of time trying to be able to keep the doors open. And I think that what this funding is going to do is, uh, is, is, is likely uh, for those programs that have continued to keep their doors open to allow them to do that in a more sustained way um, instead of, you know, kind of cobbling uh, money together. But more than that, th this funding, $10 million, is a large chunk of dollars. Um, and so what we anticipate is that we're going to be able to provide support to communities who have never had funding to have a, com a, a specialized sexual assault response program uh, in place. And so, um, as Minister says, this funding is going to last for three years. It's not going to be everything that is needed in the province, um, but it's going to take us an awfully long way to uh, provide support in ways that we haven't been able to provide really ever. Next question is from Lisa Yusta, News 1130. 
Hi, Minister. You're talking about the the numbers and that we don't have them yet for this type of crime. I'm wondering if you can talk about also the other types of crime that's being seen in the province. We know that there was a turn to residential crime and break-ins at um, businesses that were left empty. What are you expecting now that we're seeing things open up again? Are you thinking things are going to go back to what we saw before? Well, certainly uh, we know that uh, when we saw the fact that uh, people were staying at home and we saw that uh, many businesses um, um, shut down uh, during the uh, the main part of our of the epidemic that we have faced uh, so far, the pandemic, that we did see a, a rise in uh, opportunistic crimes, uh, particularly in uh, commercial areas. Uh, police are aware of that. Local governments have been aware of that, and so police, you know, obviously made operational decisions to to focus on that. And certainly, I think it is our expectation that as um, we are now entering into uh, into phase two, and you are seeing more uh, activity, uh, more economic activity taking place, and you're seeing more businesses being able to uh, to reopen, uh, and people being able to take advantage of that. That uh, I would hope and expect that we would see uh, a decrease. Uh, in that in that kind of uh, crime that we saw uh, a spike, uh, not just here but uh, in jurisdictions right across the country uh, in relation to the uh, to the COVID pandemic. Next is Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Um, you've alluded to yeah, sexual violence is up during COVID, and so obviously time is of the essence. So how quickly can this $10 million be mobilized to help survivors now? And if I am one of those people, what, what will that look like and how that can help me right now? Um, well, certainly uh, we are working uh, with EVA BC to develop the criteria for the grants. Uh, it is our desire to get the, uh, the money flowing uh, as, uh, as quickly as, as possible. Um, what will happen is that once the criteria are in place, then organizations will be able to to, uh, to apply, uh, you know, for particular services that they want to uh, to be able to provide, and it will vary, of course, from community to community. And as Tracy said a moment ago, uh, one of the things that we are uh, we are expect to see is communities that have not been able to provide uh, services uh, for uh, for sexual assault uh, victims and survivors that for a first time that they will be able to uh, to be able to do that. So we're expecting a variety of services uh, to be provided uh, by organizations right across uh, the, the province and we want to move as, as quickly uh, as we can and we're both committed uh, uh, to doing just that. Next question is from Lisa Cordesco, CHLY. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm wondering, Tracy, how has COVID-19 affected the ability to deliver services? That's a really excellent question, Lisa. And I would say that in the immediate aftermath of the of the outbreak and the lockdown, um, we uh, went to Minister Farnworth um, and said that we needed to have our services be designated as essential because one of the one of the key aspects of responding to sexual assault is to take survivors to the hospital um, for those uh, that have been physically injured and to provide uh, ensure that they have medical assistance um, and also for those that want to have a forensic uh, examination and evidence collected. So that all happens at the hospital. We weren't able to get in the door of a lot of hospitals because. A, we didn't have um, a de a emergency, uh, essential service designation, and B, we didn't have any PPE. So Minister Farnworth, within a day, he designated everybody as uh, essential services, so he solved that one. The next problem was the PPE, and so we sought out to try to access PPE for a number of weeks. Um, so I'm happy to tell you that uh, through some grants uh, from uh, for organizations like the Canadian Food Services Workers um, and others, we've been able to b purchase uh, uh, masks and gloves and sanitizer. We also had a huge donation of PPE and we're in the process right now of sending that out across the province. So, so that's the kind of outward facing services. What also happened immediately in the aftermath is uh, our people were sent home by their employers and told to work at home. And they were asked to contact their clients
clients and check their voicemail uh, from work and to be available is, is as, in as much a seamless way as possible. Um, and I think, you know, I think we've all been struggling with, uh, in the early days we were all struggling with trying to um, essentially work from home when that wasn't something that we were used to. Uh, that raised the issue of cell phones and laptops and uh, computer systems. And so uh, we uh, worked very hard to put in place uh, cell phones and phone plans so that our services could uh, have the tools that they need in order to do their jobs. Um, and those phones are in the process of being sent out. We also were able to get a donation from TELUS uh, for phones for women who experience violence so that they had a lifeline uh, phone that they could keep private um, and, and reach out for help. And uh, there's other things that we're doing trying to put in place uh, secure aspects of Zoom um, and other platforms that are encrypted on both ends so that a live uh, chat can go on between survivors and their counselors. So these are pre-existing uh, survivors that are were in the process of healing and talking with their counselors and uh, doing what essentially is called processing work. Um, so it's really been challenging from the perspective of uh, making sure that people have the mobile ability to deliver service that, that didn't exist pre-COVID. I think, you know, if there's a, if there's a silver lining in this at all, that, that post-COVID, and I know that we all look forward to that day, um, that hopefully by then our services will be more mobile and will be more seamless and will be, have the ability to go back and forth from their offices to home. We're expecting another wave in the fall, and so if we can have the programs have what they need in place, the equipment, the platforms, the PPE, I think we're going to be in much better shape than we were on day one or in week one. Next question is from Katie DeRosa, Times Colonist. Hi there. Uh, this message is for uh, Tracy. Um, some police departments have released stats about domestic violence that, that does uh, has seen an uptick, particularly I've been looking in Greater Victoria area. Is domestic violence perhaps a precursor to more serious sexual assault, or how are those two uh, connected? That's a great question. Um, and so one of the things that we that guides us, those of us that respond to domestic violence, is a set of 19 risk factors for lethal or severe uh, violence that may occur. You know, one of the things that we know about domestic violence is that the best predictor of future violence is past violence. And so there's a very clear set of guidelines and risk factors that the police and corrections um, and uh, the prosecutors and the victim service workers and child protection use to help us understand the difference between what might be a high risk case and a case that maybe perhaps in that moment in time is lower risk. And sexual assault is on the, is on the Richter scale of a, of a, of a serious concern. Um, so when we see sexual assault happen in the context of uh, domestic violence, it's something to take very seriously. Uh, on our website at endingviolence.org, uh, all of the rest of the 19 risk factors are there. You just have to type in domestic violence risk factors and the 19 will pop up. For those people that might be interested in whether or not they have concerns to take more seriously for loved ones or themselves, but uh, there is a relationship between domestic violence and sexual assault for sure. Sexual assault also occurs uh, outside of a domestic violence situation um, between people who have some acquaintanceship. It doesn't have to be in an intimate relationship. It could be the friend of somebody. It could be a coworker. It could be somebody that you, you go to class with on campus. And it could be a stranger. Um, so the impact of sexual assault goes beyond an intimate relationship. But when it's committed within an in intimate relationship, it's considered a very serious act. Next question is from Mary Brooks, West Shore Voice. Hi, um, this funding announcement today is very important for dealing with current realities. I'm just wondering what sort of programs, curriculum or education are in place in broader society by government or otherwise to try and diminish or even prevent sexual assault and domestic violence in the first place? Um, we have a, a number of uh, uh, programs uh, earmarked um, right across the province dealing with, you know, not just sexual assault but domestic violence. There's about $40 million being spent annually. Uh, a lot of those programs are education oriented and they're provided by a range of, uh, of groups uh, that range from organizations. Uh, in fact, all the way to the, uh, the Be a Bystander campaign that is 
has been spearheaded by the uh, the BC Lines, for example. Um, that uh, so there is a, a, a range of a, a range of programs uh, that uh, that that uh, that we do. We know that we can do more. Um, I know that uh, my uh, colleague uh, Mitzi uh, has been working uh, on on this issue uh, and doing consultations, and um, she may want to elaborate uh, a bit uh, a bit more uh, on the nature of some of the programs that are that are provided. Next question is from Lisa Houston, News 1130. A couple of questions about people reaching out when they need assistance right now. So this may be more for Tracy. Um, how do people do this if they're stuck in their homes? Like, how do they get to the phone? How do they get to the computer to do this? And for those who, who manage to get out, do we have enough spaces to house people who are escaping domestic violence right now in the province? Another really good question, um, and I, again, I would fall back on the ingenuity of, uh, of people in need. Um, I think, you know, we are concerned about the, uh, the isolation and the lockdown and how that traps people um, in, uh, potentially, those that are in abusive relationships, how that traps them. I think that even with the lockdown, we've seen many people have to carry on with grocery shopping, um, with uh, taking their kids to the park or having a small family picnic in the park, carrying on with childcare, perhaps uh, delivering groceries to their elderly parents. And I think it's in all of those intersections that we're hearing that survivors, if they have a phone, if they have the means to reach out to services, um, that those are when the calls are happening. Um, it, and also in many households, uh, there are, there are the, the abusers that are in those households that have continued on with work. Um, not all work has been shut down, and so in, in those circumstances, those survivors have been able to, um, to reach out. But I think, you know, I think what we're all concerned about um, is the isolation and is the lack of freedom to be able to reach out for help. And, uh, and again, I think that once we uh, are in perhaps phase three and people are a lot more free to move, um, we are uh, bracing for a higher demand um, and uh, that's why we're working so hard to try to put in place funding like this program is being announced today so that there are staff in place to meet a higher demand um, and also equipment for all of those existing services. Next question is from Sandy Hall, CFAX 1070. Yes, hi. Uh, you did mention that you had a lot of catch-up to do, and I know there was a lot of uh, cuts, was it almost two decades ago. I'm just wondering how much catch-up is needed and how close this $10 million might bring you to that. Uh, Tracy here again. Um, I, I could say, and I would concur with the Minister, uh, that there is a lot of catch-up to do. Um, as the minister said, that there are uh, about 400 anti-violence programs in place. Uh, many of them have uh, one staff um, or one part-time staff, and I think that that is something that we're interested in talking to the ministry um, and the province about as time goes on. The cuts that happened to the sexual assault centers in 2002 equated to about 1.5 million. So all of the contracts to all 21 sexual assault centers, um, the cuts equated to 1.5 million. And so this, this announcement today of 10 million um, is going to be able to um, put back in place, I hope, some of those services and expand into communities and indigenous communities and rural communities that never had those services to begin with. We're going to go back to Parliamentary Secretary Dean for closing remarks. Thank you. I just want... Thank you. I just want to um, encourage anybody who's experiencing violence, is living in fear, or if you're concerned about a colleague or a friend or a family member, please reach out. The services are there, and, uh, and we're going to be increasing them, but services are there. And Victim Link is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, free, confidential helpline service in over 150 languages. And so you do deserve support and safety. Please do reach out. Thank you. That's all the time we have. Thank you, everyone.